Hello and thank you once again for joining with me for, as we start our second look at St Paul. And today I'm looking at the story of Paul the Persecutor. I want to begin by reading a few verses of Holy Scripture. And it's from Acts of the Apostle at chapter 7 and it's at verse 54 to the end of the chapter. It's the stoning of Stephen. Let God speak to us through this word. As the members of the council listened to Stephen, they became furious and ground their teeth at him in anger. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw God's glory and Jesus standing at the right hand side of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand side of God. With a loud cry, the members of the council covered their ears with their hands. Then they all rushed at him at once, threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses left their cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. They kept on stoning Saul as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember the sin against them. He said this and died, and Saul approved of his murder. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. Amen. We left Paul as a young man in Jerusalem studying at the feet of Gamaliel. I hope I keep saying that right or it's something like that. And he is a rising star. In his own words, he is higher above anyone else in knowledge. He seems to be one of the, the bright young things within the Jewish community of the Pharisees. You know, there were two parties, religious leadership in Jerusalem. One was the Sadducees, and they were, the best I could maybe simply describe it was, they were the royal family. They were passed down from generation to generation. And then there was the Pharisees, who, who believed slightly different things. The Sadducees didn't believe in life after death. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels or demons. The Pharisees did. And the Pharisees were made up of a whole group of different background people, such as tent makers like Saul. And so Saul is, is rising through the ranks. He can quote scripture. He can argue his point. This is an Old Testament style of, of teaching where you argue your point. And in fact, through his letters that we'll look at in a few weeks, Saul or Paul will do just that. He'll try and argue his position. But the the church was just in its infancy. The leadership had thought, uh, the leadership of the Jewish nation, the, the high council, they thought that by having Jesus killed, that would be the end. But we know it wasn't. Jesus needed to die so that the church could be born. And the Spirit had to come upon its followers. And the Spirit, thank God, still comes upon its followers today. And as this church was growing, the, the Jewish leadership couldn't really quite understand it. They weren't just a few handful, a handful of, of ordinary folk. It was starting to spread through Jerusalem. It was starting to be a threat to their authority. Last few weeks ago, I was uh, in our book club that I'm a member of. We were looking at a book written by 
a minister in the Church of Scotland. And the book was recommended for uh, uh, by one of the, the, mem the, the, the group. And it looked like it was going to be a challenging, exciting book about revival and, and, and about new ways of being the church. And so I started to read it. But I didn't get far. I didn't get far because I found the author to be different than me. Let's say that. The author was, is very evangelical. The whole remit of the book was to try and get the church to think more about mission and service. And for people to challenge others about, do you believe in God? Do you have Jesus as your saviour and Lord? And the author has done brilliant things in his church, and of that there's no doubt. And the author is full of this zeal for the Lord. And I suspect, if I'm totally honest, that part of the problem I had in not reading the book, not wanting to read the book, was an annoyance because of this man's certainty of faith. My faith has got holes in it. There is doubts. It's, it's hard work at times. And yet this man is full of certainty. In fact, at one point he speaks in a, that he speaks God's heart to the people. I would never be as sure to speak God's heart to the people. I would quote God's word from scripture, of course. But I suspect me and God are quite far apart on many things. But this evangelical zeal is perhaps, in my case, something that I lack. And I suspect, as I say, I was a bit jealous that I didn't have this zeal. Now, what I'm about to say, don't equate the two together, but Saul had that zeal. He had that zeal for the Lord and for his church, or at least the Jewish faith, centred on the temple in Jerusalem. He'd been around the fringes. He'd been the rising star. He'd been the one that no doubt was taking to meetings of the councils. I remember in my first year as training, not for the ministry, I hadn't been accepted as a candidate, but I did a placement with the church in Aberdeen just to get some understanding. And the person that I uh, was working with was the convener of the, at the time was the board of ministry. And she took me to one of the board meetings in Edinburgh where I sat in a corner and watched all the, the movers and shakers of the church of 30 or 35 years ago mixing and meeting. Indeed, we all went out and had lunch together. And it was... It was quite a, it was almost an exciting experience, just being in their presence. Saul would have got himself in the presence of the movers and shakers. In my case, I was only there to witness. Saul would have been there as one who would have had the answers. He would have been a person that was working away in the background at that point in his young life. And he was becoming more and more valued his views. And so the new church, with the execution of Jesus, the, the, the leadership of the Jewish faith hoped it would die, but it didn't. Because you and I know that the Holy Spirit came upon the church and breathed new life into the life of the apostles. See, I have a, a, a sneaking suspicion, in, and I've read this in other uh, commentaries, that Paul may have had a respect for the man Jesus, for his ethical teaching, for his use of scripture, for his cleverness in responding to difficult questions. But when Jesus was executed, he couldn't understand why this rag ragtag bunch of followers could still carry on speaking with authority, challenging the leadership of the Jewish people. He couldn't quite fathom that. His 
evangelical zeal was to preach the traditions that he had been raised at, raised on. He said he was a Jew. There was no better Jew than him. He'd fulfilled almost all of the regulations. And why couldn't others do that? And yet this new church and its followers were, were still growing and were still causing threat to the, the normal way of life. And so Jesus was executed. But the church in Jerusalem continued. And the apostles found that they were overwhelmed with work. And they needed help. And they needed help and they chose seven helpers. Seven helpers who became kind of deacons, who did the social work, the practical nature of looking after the new church family. One of them was that man Stephen that we read about. And Stephen, and you can read that in that the, the book uh, from the book of the Acts of the Apostles in chapter uh, 6 you are through to 7, through to the start of chapter 8 you can have the, the story of Stephen. I always remember from a young age in the boys brigade company for most years that I was in the boys brigade I won the Bible uh, cup for Bible knowledge. I've never quite worked out why I was able to answer all these questions, but I was able to answer. And one of the questions always was, who was the first Christian martyr? And it was Stephen. And Stephen was one of the helpers. And Stephen did amazing things. He was blessed with the Spirit. In fact, it says, Stephen, a man richly blessed by God and full of power, performed great miracles and wonders among the people. But he was opposed by some men who were members of the synagogue, which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. He made enemies, and he was arrested. And the, the part of the story that I read to you of, this, of, of Stephen is just at the end after Stephen makes a speech, and in that speech which raged, which enraged the, 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 the high council who were listening to it, he said that the Jewish faith would move away, the, the power of the temple was, was destroyed, that Jesus was the power. And then when he looked up and said he saw God, this was, oh, you don't say you see God, no one has seen God. And so he was taken out to be stoned. And you could be sure that Saul was not just the young, the young man standing behind holding the coats, although that's what it says in Scripture. Saul was not such a back, sitting in the back type character that he would have simply been there holding the coats. He would have been part of it. Of that, I have no doubt. Yes, he might have been the young lad. Yes, he might not have thrown the stones. But he would have been there. He would have been manipulating. He would have been encouraging. He would have been supporting. Because the scripture says, And Saul approved of his murder. And that was the start. You know, the very next line of the Bible says, That very day the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. The diaspora, the spreading out of faith began because of the persecution. And behind the persecution, one of the planners of the persecution was undoubtedly the clever man called Saul. This was his chance. This was his chance to show his importance, to rise up because he was clever, but I'm sure he was ambitious too. He wanted his name to be known. And this persecution was not just in other people wanted to do it. They rounded up the Jews in Jerusalem. They were threatened. They were beaten. And I suspect some lost their lives. Many were 
forced to recount, or, or recant rather, I'm thinking of the election of three counts, many were forced to recant their decision of believing in Jesus, and many refused, and many died. And it started a wave of persecution, primarily at this stage by the Jewish people, against Christians. Because the majority of Christians came from within their own ranks. And they were being taken away by this new fellowship, this new family, this new people believing. And so we have the story of Saul persecuting the church. It says, Saul tried to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragged out the believers, both men and women, and threw them into jail. Oh, imagine the horror, the fear. We have seen what persecution does around the world. We have seen the horrors of people being made homeless in Ukraine. Here was Saul, a young evangelical Jewish leader believing that his place was to persecute those folk who believe something different. To take them, men, women, and yes, I'm sure children, and throw them into prison. It was a terrible time. It was, it was dreadful. He kept making these threats of murder. You know, in chapter 9 in the book of Acts, we'll look at this a wee bit more next time we, we I, I, I speak to you when I speak about the conversion. But the conversion starts with, in the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He wasn't happy just going around gathering the people. He went to the high priest, it says. He asked for letters of introduction to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he should find any there, followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial, for punishment. He was going to wipe them out. These people who dared to challenge the Jewish leader's position and their power. You know, Saul was successful in what he did. He was undoubtedly a clever man. He was undoubtedly a manipulative man. He was undoubtedly one who would use circumstances for his own benefit. But he was more than a quote minder. He was influential. He would have been one that would have been stirring up this hatred against the, the, the Christians. Because in his zealous approach to his faith, he saw them as undermining the real faith in God. The Christians, they fled from Jerusalem. And actually, as they fled, they told people in other parts where they went of Jesus. And rather than stifle the message and kill off the message by persecuting in Jerusalem, they caused the message to start to spread. And they thought that when they went to these other places, they would be safe, the Christians. But the Christians had reckoned without Paul. He'd remembered that earlier in his nation's history, the Romans had given the high priest in Jerusalem the right to have the Jewish criminals extradited from other parts of the empire. So he went to the high priest to ask for a letter to give him authority to pursue Christians to Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and for sentence. And it was while on the road to Damascus Saul would have this life-changing event. Not just life-changing for him, but for all of us. Christians who would follow. 
How am I going to sum up this section, Paul the Persecutor? Is it good to be an evangelical? Is it good to have religious zeal? Well, of course it is. Of course it's good to be full of God's Spirit. But I think there's a warning there. And I think the warning is there throughout history. For those who would use religious zeal, perhaps for their own ends. Perhaps to advance their own careers. Perhaps there was a lack of understanding. Do you know, as Christians, I don't believe that our place is to attack people who have got other faiths or no faith. As Christians, I believe our role is to support, help, care for people of all faiths and no faith. As a Christian, I'm reminded of Jesus' words to love the neighbor, our neighbour. Not just love those who are part of our belief structure. Not just love those who go to the same church that we go to. But to love our neighbour. And I think, personally, that more people come to faith through acts of love than through acts of evangelical zeal. I have no proof for that. I have no evidence in my own ministry for that. But I do get concerned that sometimes evangelical zeal of whatever faith causes people to be blinkered and narrow. The church, down through the generations, I've had many times when it attacked those of no faith or, or other faiths. The church now exists in a time when the majority of people in our land, I suspect, don't believe. Our place of power, of authority, of influence has dwindled so that at times we feel as if we're just hanging on. And that's when Oh, if only we had this evangelical zeal, that would turn things round. Paul saw the light. His life was turned round by meeting Jesus. We'll think about that the next time we meet. But in the meantime, just think of how we can live a life that Jesus would want us to live. A life of service, a life of care. Not necessarily beating on the doors of those round about and saying, do you believe in God? I remember many, many years ago while I was surveyor in Dundee, used to walk down what was then the old Overgate in Dundee at lunchtime to go to the, the, sh the shops for lunch. And there was often a person walking up and down the streets with the with the, the boards on with do you believe or are you going to hell or all sorts of things challenging people. That was how they, th they thought people would be converted. The fear of the Lord. And it's important that we do fear the Lord. But not live a life of fear. But a life of love. Anyway, enough of me pontificating about things that maybe are beyond my pay grade and are more related to what the scripture says and certainly what God says in our hearts. But Paul, we can learn much from this young lad in Tarsus who he was very proud of being from Tarsus, who went to Jerusalem to study and who became one of the rising stars whose commitment and whose dedication and whose evangelical zeal perhaps pushed them over the edge rather than trying to work for God became an instrument against God's way. But who could, after all of that, 
still meet with Jesus and see the light. Thanks for watching, folks. Take care of yourself, and in your own way, take care of one another. And may God bless you and those you love. Bye-bye. Next time, we'll talk about, as I've said, the conversion of Paul or Saul.